So, delighted to be at this theatre. In fact, I'm going to come around the front because it's, it's the first time I've actually ever been here, let alone speak here, and it feels so close I can touch you all. So, Ia and Jill are going to be the brains of tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of the brawn. Now, my name's Adrian Hayes. I hail from the New Forest down in, in Hampshire. I live at Livington, but I lived most of my life abroad. And I wear a number of different hats. As, a, as an adventurer, I suppose professional venture, I mean, that's what I've been, but I've been doing it since I was about 16 years of age. That 20 years has just flown by. Um, and, um, but also as a speaker, as an author, and as a leadership team uh, and personal coach, as an executive coach, I've got a campaigning hat, an author hat, a few other things as well. And it's the exploration side, adventure side, and the leadership team coaching that Mars One, the Mars One project, and belay on the financial latest repercussions just been announced last week, but Mars One asked me to come and be an advisor. I'm also an astronomy and space nut. I've been, since I was a, a young boy, and followed the last Apollo missions as a very young boy, which goes away my age. But um, so Mars One brought me in really as to advise on the dynamics and hold the human aspects of long expeditions, plus the team dynamics, which of course is so critical. Now, I have been lucky enough to be to been on our own planet in some places that have felt like a different planet. This was the top of Greenland, the very, very north of Greenland, a place called J.P. Cox Fjord. And it is one of the most amazing places I've ever been in my life. Uh, and I think what made this so special is because we thought we were only about a handful in history had ever been down there. This is right on the Arctic Ocean. No one had ever been there apart from two Norwegians. That's all we think. A most magical, pristine place. And the other place, which is even more so, because Greenland, there is life. Uh, you Sometimes birds do come across. You know there's polar bears. There is settlements. And sometimes an airplane goes across, and you look up at this upstairs, and you're thinking you're there at business class watching this film, tucking into a nice meal, and we've been on this road crossing the length of Greenland for 67 days. Now, this was Antarctica, and this really was the most it felt like being on another planet. Because the difference between Greenland and everywhere else on our Earth is that in Antarctica, nothing lives. Nothing lives. You're on your own with the sky, the sun, and the ice. There's no birds, there's no mosses, there's no flowers, there's no aircraft flying across the sky. You really feel like you're on this different world. And apart from the, the sheer beauty, what was so special about these places is the wavelength that our brains became on. Uh, and I'm thinking of how contemplation and focus and deep thinking, all these things that you don't have in today's world. And I'll come back to this in five minutes or so. Because when I came back to the real world, the so-called real world, it took me about a year to get over this. Now, this to an explorer, this is, you know, this is great. So what's next? You know, because exploration has been continuously through the years and looking beyond the, the, the greater boundaries. And of course, Mars is one of them. It's in our sights. It's in our sights. Within a generation, I think it'll be Longer, because I used to work, I used to sell Airbuses for my living, and every aircraft that's ever been produced has had a delay. So it'll be 20, late 2030s, 2040s, maybe even longer before anyone will end up going to Mars. But the difference, that picture in Antarctica looked great, but the difference going to Mars, I mean, firstly, those great vistas, that viewpoints, half the time Mars is clouded in dust, because the atmosphere is so thin that that dust just obliterates all vision. Secondly, you're always going to be cut off from the fresh air. And I know myself, I've been on a ship for about a week without any fresh air, and I'm going stir crazy. It's called cabin fever. So the fact that you'll never, ever be able to go outside and sample that fresh air, even at home, I work at home, I've got to get outside. That's a real, real challenge. And some of you here may be working in an office without any natural light. Anybody here? how that is difficult as well. So there's a challenge on that. But secondly, there's a challenge in some of the things I do that you might lose your life. 
but we think we're doing it to keep fit, or we're getting very, very fit. When you go to Mars, you're actually in danger of destroying your health. The radiation, the radiation is, the radio risk, risk is very large indeed. The chance of you getting cancer is quite extreme. Uh, you are going to be subject to relationships. You know, you can't really sort of say the Mars One project was a lifelong mission. You can't start dating somebody, and you've been dating them for eight years, and then you tell your partner, well, I'm, I'm going to Mars next month. And she says, well, how long are you going for? I said, I'm going forever. And you're never coming back. Now, that was the Mars One project because it was a one-way mission. But um, so you've got dangers to your health. But also, the bodies work in remarkable ways. You know, when we go to cold, this was my two teammates on my North Pole expedition. When you go to extreme colds, and this was minus 60, the body re reacts. It takes your blood away from your, from your extremities and pushes them to your vital organs because it's about survival. It doesn't think one step ahead. And so you might get frostbite, you might lose your fingers and your toes. The body doesn't think that. That's not priority. When you go to altitude, the body produces more red blood cells. And what you have going around your blood is this red sludge. And again, it helps protect your vital organs, but it doesn't protect your fingers and your toes. You might lose them. The, the body doesn't think you might be on a smartphone in about 24 hours. Our world today that we live in, and I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated with this. You know, and Ian might uh, have some more words to say on this. Psychologists and scientists are finding that our brains are changing shape to cope with the onslaught of information. We were not designed to be sitting in front of screens and smartphones. So the body is saying, the brain is saying, I don't need deep thinking, contemplation, strategizing. I just need to be multitasking. And it's actually changing the shape of our brains. Now, when you go to, into space, basically, the body says, I don't need legs. So it starts to dissolve your legs, which is why we always see it. I asked my parents when I saw astronauts coming back, why can't they walk? That was just you know, a, a sort of a week away, two weeks in space. Then if you're going for a long mission, you may not have any legs at the end of it. And Mr. Blobby's coming back. But the science behind the, the Mars One project, the science behind that was if you were on Mars for 10 years, because some people might think, well, you know, okay, you know, there's always going to be technology to, to get us back in, in due course. Because the technology of Mars One was that we've got, we've got present technology to get there and land much earlier than we've got it to bring us back. But after 10 years at the lower gravity that your legs, your legs, your bones will be so brittle, you won't be able to enter the Earth's atmosphere. Your body is a shatter, your brain, but your bones will shatter. So you're putting your health uh, at risk. So why do so many people want to go into space? NASA had about 18,000 applicants applied last year. The Mars One project had 200,000 people applied to go to Mars on a one-way mission. That may sound a little bit stupid. So why, why so many people want to do it? Well, I wrote my, my new book, which I've just written, on one man's climb. And it's about my journey up K2, but it's as much a journey about human development, society, real teamwork, and the, our lives in the world below as it is the story of climbing a mountain. And I go head on into chapter one about why people climb K2, climb Everest, why more and more people are doing such extreme things. And the number one reason is significance. Significance. And I love that Shackleton quote, because back then, significance, back in, in throughout history, it's a basic human need, either intrinsic significance, personal goals, self-worth, direction, meaning, or extrinsic, respect, recognition, fame, honors, and awards. What's happened in the world, what's, and I find this absolutely fascinating, and I, I'm gonna be probably trained to be a psychologist when I get too old to do these long uh, adventures, is how the world's changed the last 20 years. The internet has given us all more this need for intrinsic significance. We see the world out there, and we're not prepared to be pawns on a production line, and social media 
has given us that drive, subconscious or consciously, to show it to the world. Basically, look what I've done. And you can see it in every single thing. Selfies, social media posts, pictures on business class, Ironman triathlons, climbing Everest, climbing K2. Space is just another example. So, that's why people, the first part I want to speak about, why people want to go there. I think it is for significance. And Mars One, we're going to beam this as a reality TV show. I mean, it's going to be like Love Island without the tans, the six packs, and without swapping partners every week. But um, that is what I believe the main reason people want to get there. Now, the second part I want to ask is, is the personal characteristics. What do you think you need to be personal wise to get to Mars? And there's one thing that, any astronaut shares with us who do long camping trips across ice caps and jungles and deserts, and that is you've got to be extremely fit. And I remember when I watched Superstar, Superstars, I think when I was a kid, and saw racing drivers, and I thought, oh, they're not going to be fit as the footballers and the rugby players. They were the fittest sportsmen on the planet. And it's a similar thing. You have to be supremely fit to be an astronaut. Now, the other thing is you have, which something they don't share with us, is you have to be supremely intelligent. Uh, you have to be a master in biology, in science, in, in medicine, in engineering, astrophysics, uh, jet engine, pulp propulsion, all these things. You've got to be bright, extremely bright. But what else? What else do you need? Now, I'm going to expand this, expand this to really, to a wider circle of what skills we really need in today's workplace, all of us, all of us sitting here. Uh, because it's quite relevant to what you're looking at Mars. Now, of all these surveys of skills needed in the workplace, and this is in the face of AI and technology, which I instantly think that AI is one of the greatest challenges we actually have in the universe today. Climate change gets all the headlines and pronouncements and statesman-like uh, speeches, but AI and other things are just as a bigger problem as that. Now, so Google commissioned a survey of 400 CEOs across the world. And they asked them what skills were needed in the workplace in today and moving into the future for all levels. And they were, number one, problem solving. Okay. Number two, teamwork. Number three, critical thinking. And number four, communication. And the others sort of fell, fell away a little bit behind. These were the top four by some way. And I looked at this, I thought, well, this is quite interesting as a, as a leadership and team coach, personal coach, because the first two obviously go to the person, problem, and critical thinking. And the second two, really, on the teamwork and communication about the other. Now, put them together, and you've got something. I'm going to play a little clip from Apollo 30, one of my favorite clips from this film, about putting these four things together. Gene, we have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on a limb. Which meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. You're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Handed us this one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this, using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Maybe get some coffee going too, someone. There we go. So. Of all these attributes and, and self-determination and discipline and perseverance and all these other things, you've got to be a problem solver. And I think how many people here saw The Martian with Matt Damon? Yeah. I think that goes to show, you know, you've got to have that ability to solve problems on your own and as with a team. All the other attributes, I think, you know, you probably know as good as me what you need to be a, those personal attributes to go to Mars. But to me... The real critical thing is these personal attributes are overshadowed by the team attributes. And this is where my passion comes in, my passion for teamwork comes in. And 
If I ask you what makes a great team, you'll all know the answers because you've all been in great teams. We do very little on our own. You've all been great teams. You've all been mediocre teams. You've all been in some pretty poor teams, I expect, in your life. So as I said, what makes a great team? It's camaraderie. It's fun. It's respect. It's great leader. It's communication. It's all these things. But these two things, teamwork and communication, are absolutely critical. Now, let me give you some examples away from space about some great teams. The first one I'm going to show you is an SAS four-man patrol. Here they are. They've been blacked out, balaclavas. We can't show their faces. But th there's a misconception about SAS four-man patrol because there's a buddy-buddy system. You're dependent on each other. A lot of people think that people in the SAS are alpha males, you know, egos, all the rest of it. No room for all that. I spent two years in 21 SAS, and I would call myself a Zulu female, far from an alpha male. Now, let's look at another team in the sporting side. This is a team that's not bad in their field of sport. They've been number one in the sporting world in their own sport for the last 500 years. And again, there is no egos. There's no stars in the All Blacks. That understanding, that, that camaraderie, that gelling, that clicking, it is part of the values of being an All Black. And I think this is where football sometimes falls apart because there are many egos and many stars who think they're better than the rest of the team. This is, I've obviously been on some fantastic expedition teams. Uh, many, I've been on some bad ones as well. But this is my buddy for K2, Al Hancock, Canadian. Now, the trust I have in Al is second to none. I would trust this guy for the rest of my life. I'll always climb together. And this is the Mars One project. And their whole philosophy is we're not even selecting individuals. We're selecting teams. But all these teams, all these teams, they put work into it. They put work into making that great team. And this is one of my favorite quotes of teamwork. I'm a member of a team, and I rely on that team. I defer to it and sacrifice for it, because the team, not the individual, is the ultimate champion. It's absolutely fundamental. Military, sport, expeditions, and space. Teamwork is fundamental. Let's go to the corporate world, or the other world. Now, how much work do we put into this? Well, firstly, we reward people by individual performance. Remuneration is commission, bonuses is based on individual performance. Does that aid teamwork? Not really. And what work do we put into making great teams down here on sea level? Well, mostly we do sweet FA, except for the once a year team building day. Yes, you've got it. Now, let me just tell you, these will bring one thing and one thing only, and that is called fun. You do not become an SES four-man patrol member by crossing some grass on some planks. You do not become the All Blacks by building a structure out of cardboard, wood, plastic, and balloons. You do not climb K2 by crossing a swimming pool with floats and logs and tape to put them together. And you do not get into space by going 10-pin bowling. You get my point. It's critical. And to show you, and I could go on this because it's my passion, it's my work, I live and breathe this stuff. But let me give you one example of how Mars One was taking this teamwork. A four-man team. Let's take the four of you here, okay? The four of you here, two men, two women. Could you just sit next, just one seat there? Because I want you to be a team. You know, the openness and transparency in this team was if you had a problem with this person here, first of all, it's brought out onto the open. It's discussed and transpa made transparent without taking it personally. And either he changes his behavior, whatever it is, he belches when he eats, he's got body odor, he talks too much, whatever. Either he changes his behavior or you go to another team. Now, that is quite revolutionary in teamwork because the world will say, accept people for your differences. Accept everyone's different. Accept him. Accept him that he has body odor, or he, he is, talks too much. Excuse me, don't take it personally. OK. Um, but no, the, if the thing is, if it's not confronted, it will fester in you and fester in you and fester in you the rest of your life. So it has to be confronted. And with Hancock, 
So we have that agreement with Hancock. We had this implicit set of agreements. It's all about the agreements. And we had one of them, of many, many, many agreements, is that we could say whatever we could to each other without taking it personally. Without anyone taking it personally. Because if you take your eye off the ball, if you're festering, if you're annoyed, or whether it's climbing a mountain, whether it's playing for the All Blacks, whether it's in a four-man patrol, whether it's going to space, if you're festering on something that's annoying you and you haven't discussed it, you could lose your life. It could be dangerous to man or life. So that is just a smitten of some of the attributes of what I'm basically saying is why people do these things, which I'm saying is significant, is a, is a major driver in today's world with some harmless uh, examples, some unintegral examples, and some, as was happened last week, very, very dangerous examples. Why people with the personal characteristics, you've got to be intelligent, an expert in your fields, and fit, a problem solver, and a great communicator. And above all this, team dynamics. You have got to work on a team for what's going to be a very, very long mission. That's a spin. I'll be there at the end to answer any more questions. But thank you very much for listening. And here we go to Mars. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's nice to be back here. I've been here in June last year, and we were talking, we were celebrating the uh, Odyssey 2001, which was uh, a really good event. Um, so I, I think I've recognized a couple of people <laughs> from the audience. It's lovely to see you back. Um, I would like to um, talk to you about uh, one introduct well introduce you to one concept about future exploration and uh, I always wondered about what will happen when people are faced with uh, extreme situation when they are faced something that they've never faced before um, and uh, I started with personal exploration um, my mother is in the audience and um, she does know some of the things I've done and others she doesn't. <laughs> I shall not reveal them all here. But um, I wanted to jump with the parachute. Um, I wanted to skydive. I wanted to feel the air. I wanted to know how it feels when you're faced with a situation when you don't know what will happen and how you would react. And Future missions, missions to Mars, will be in the first instance, exploration within. Before we explore the space, outer space, beyond our orbit, we'll have to explore the space within. And this journey is so personal and um, so much has to be supported by the team that surrounds you that it's vital to understand that or at least study it because we don't know it. We do know some uh, concepts from people who explored by themselves or by people who went to Antarctic missions, or the submariners who travel sort of the underwater for a long time. But we do not know what happens really in every individual's um, mind. So what I want you to do today, I want you to take you through some personal inner experience that astronauts and cosmonauts had when they uh, went into space. So these are the three images captured of Alexei Leonov, whom I have been fortunate to speak with one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Uh, and uh, he um, told me <laughs> very um, um, beautifully of why he decided to, f to become an astronaut. First, firstly, he wanted to become a pilot. He's actually an artist, and he likes to paint. And he wanted to fly higher so that he can capture how um, really the clouds look. So he wanted to get closer to the sky and then to be able to capture it. And the, the image um, he, here that you see, he's actually in the outer space and unable to control his movements. and. Uh, doesn't know whether he will be able to get back into the spacecraft. Um, because what happened is that when they were um, training in the parabolic flight, which the aircraft that dips and climbs, and they simulates the microgravity, 
he was tall, then he was trained to compress his body and push as hard as he can in order to exit the aircraft, sorry, the, the spacecraft, but within this parabolic flight. And that's what he's practiced. And when he's done that, when they opened the hatch and he compressed uh, himself as tightly as possible and um, propelled himself against the spacecraft, he actually um, shoot out so fast that he was surprised. His um, um, colleague was surprised and uh, he was unable to stop bouncing back and forth from the aircraft, from the spacecraft because um, there was nothing on the outside to grasp um, and his tether had an elastic um, element in it so he would stretch quite far and then bounce back into the ship and that was pretty much the first man in space. Uh, <laughs> it was terrifying because um, his suit started to expand and not only that he had nothing to grasp, his uh, was, uh, gloves were separating from his um, um, body. They were coming apart because the pressure of the suit was growing and the suit expanding. So he couldn't get into his feet uh, of the, the, the shoes or the space suit uh, at the bottom. He couldn't feel it. And also his gloves were starting to expand and he couldn't actually compress his body. And um, he sweat so much that he actually was swimming in his boots by the, by the end of the mission. Um, so, and this is the person who speaks very calmly about being in space. <laughs> and then when he comes back, he talks about its beauty and how it changed him. And how, um, so in, in, on this, in all this extreme immensity of what this person experienced, he's actually <laughs> had the time <laughs> to witness and really appreciate what was happening with him. And I think um, no one, no psychologist can ask a questionnaire, can compose a questionnaire to ask what the person really feels inside. And, um, but, and really the astronauts, they touch us by what they tell us and what it really felt like. And that's what touches us and that's what expands our understanding and expands our curiosity. So this is a quote from um, a German astronaut. And um, I think this is a quite interesting uh, change in value and change in perception, which we do see when astronauts and cosmonauts go to space. Because we have these concepts, and one of the concepts he discusses is that the, he's always been told that the Earth is surrounded by the ocean of air, so the atmosphere is like a big ocean. But when he came out into space and saw uh, just a slight curve in the thinnest, thinnest sliver of the atmosphere, and he realized that it's not an ocean, not the way we, we thought of it as such a massive um, component of our Earth. It's just a, a very thin, fragile atmosphere. And that perception, it really moves people. And then they actually do, when they come back, to Earth, they do things differently. It changed them from within, it changed their behavior, it changed their value, um, and um, equally so, it happens um, through pretty much every astronaut, although it's not spoken widely, but this phenomenon is not um, captured or explored yet in depth. So if we could play a video for a moment. So this is uh, uh, a uh, Gene Cernan mission, so I just want you to listen to what they say. Uh, Dave and Jim, while you're doing the dust in there, did you get a check on the LRV mirrors for us? If so, uh, I, that's not a copy. Yeah, they're both open and uh, all four have been dusted. Okay, good. The tape came off your plus, Dave. Did it really? Yeah, it's ripped on both sides now. I wonder where I'm getting it. I'll be getting it in the rover. It could be. I think I see where I'm getting it. No, it couldn't be there. No, the seats are smooth. Okay, Dave. Okay, give me the brush, I'll put it back. You can head in and uh, crank up the LEC and we'll haul all that stuff up nice and easy, like. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I want you to... So, what has been happening there is that they, they were just... They were just doing a regular thing at, um, 
on, on the moon, which you do, they were dusting each other off. And there was nothing, <laughs> and checking the instruments. So there was nothing really extraordinary happening on the moon while they were doing their work. They were just doing fixing things around. Uh, they were uh, doing this in a very bulky suits. But the work that they were doing is very calm, very collected, just something that probably you would do, I don't know, repairing something in the backyard. It's, it's not an extraordinary work, but the environment where they're in and what they're doing and how they got there and the whole concept of where they're doing it is, is what makes the difference on their attitude and how they treat each other and what they do and the fact that they need to rely to each other to survive. So if there is anything that... Um, someone is asking you to do, they will do it instantly because they depend on each other. And in this case, they had dust that they needed to remove from each other from the sensors. And in fact, later in this video, he does go climb back to, to check the systems. So, um, and among all of this, they need to pay, to the to pay attention to the environment. And this is another quote from uh, Eugene Cernan when he was talking about being um, on the moon uh, and then coming back and saying it, how it actually, he doesn't think of the moon as being far away. It's now be became part of his home. He thinks he can, it's not a romantic idea of being on the moon or just looking at the moon. He's actually work, work, worked and um, on the moon and he thinks it's actually something that expanded to be his home. So that concept of thinking that we can actually reach other planets really has already happened in human experience. Although it's not a planet, it's a planetary body, but nevertheless it's something that it's completely isolated from us. And um, speaking with uh, Eugene uh, Cernan, you would <laughs> find him very... Um, in a way, ordinary, but he listens with such um, depth to every one of your questions and, and tries to answer it exactly to what you're trying to, to ascertain. So he can really trans uh, tell you about the experience that he had, so you can really touch you, so that you can understand what has, hap has happened to, to him and with his, with his team. So this is something that they have discussed coming back from the moon. So we spent most of the way home discussing what color the moon was. <laughs> Out of all the things you could be discussing, you know, being on the moon, they would be discussing what color, you know, the moon was. It's um, so unusual, if you wish. This is another quote from um, a NASA astronaut, Russell um, Schweikart. And he's talking about the experience of um, being on um, um, outside and how much um, difference it made to his own personal perception and how it, it suddenly, everything becomes different and very precious. And the image that you see is actually part of uh, Australian landscape. But um, we had some astronauts report to us that when they look during the experiments into the uh, microscopes and they're studying some cells or they're studying tissue and then they look out um, of the ISS and they look down on earth and they see the same thing <laughs> and they have to um, you know double check are they still looking at the microscope uh, or are they looking actually uh, on earth so there is this macro and micro um, macro and micro effect on when you are looking from something in a very detailed level and when you're looking at back at our Earth. And uh, these are the impressions that um, astronauts find most difficult to communicate because it's something that touches you and it changes you forever. And you really don't know how to explain it to somebody else. <clears throat> this is something that future crew might see in space. Um, this is uh, taken by Cassini, <laughs> and uh, if you can imagine flying and suddenly seeing something just propelling past you when you have not seen anything for a very long time, um, and it reminds you something <laughs> of the 
movies that you've seen back on Earth, it might be quite frightening to start with, <laughs> but then when you recognize the body, uh, you understand what it is. So we are not... Um, so in the future, we need to imagine what will happen on other planets. Um, and we can only really do that through understanding what, what is happening to us within and how we explore and understand the environment around us. And um, my colleague is in, in the audience, Olga Bogdaryova, and uh, myself, we were working together on the project for European Space Agency to develop uh, tools for psychological support for long-duration missions. And part of the tools, we had to understand the type of issues the crew will experience and have. And of course, um, to, um, as a psychologist, you would start with um, something that's already defined. But things that are already defined are um, quite far down the line in terms of where you don't want the astronauts to reach, such as depression, or uh, they might develop some phobia, or they might develop aggression, or they might uh, find it that it's very boring, and they, as a result, would be very different in their behavior. But in order to understand that, you need to understand, you need to start from very little things to understand the little elements of the environment that they work in, and then combine them to understand what type of issues that they're likely to encounter. And what we have done is that we have systematically went through every single um, experiment which is, has been done to isolate people in the environment that is likely to um, appear as missions to the Moon and Mars. Uh, this included um, as well an, all Antarctic missions uh, and records that we had, all the experiments that were done on Earth on simulating um, Mars missions, and also all the ISS uh, and space station um, in orbit. We had collaboration from NASA and ESA and Roscosmos, and we've defined this field of problems. And what you see in black is not meant to be red. This is just kind of a visual landscape, is the issues that um, are on crossing from, if you can look, for example, on Excel file, you have um, an issue on the left, an issue on the top, and on the cross, when they meet together, there is a specific problem or scenario. Um, for example, you would, um, for, for, in a long mission, uh, you will have things that will start to break, they will start to chip. It's inevitable. <coughs> Two years in space flight, it's not likely that it will go out without uh, a problem. And if these things continuously happen and something else happen, so the problems become, uh, they escalate, they don't happen just on one thing. And these issues escalate and become uh, something that the mission control has to resolve. And we needed to outline systematically every possible scenario based on understanding of previous work. And what we come up with is this matrix. And as you can see, the points are in black. It's something that were recorded. But the rest of it, we haven't even described. So if you look at this field, about 75% of uh, potential situations we have not even seen in simulation, we have not considered, and we don't even, uh, not even ready at the time to uh, how to prevent them, how to monitor, to monitor them, and how to resolve them. So as part of this work, we've uh, met with a team of psychologists, we've met with uh, submariners, we, we had Antarctic mission commander, um, we had uh, astronauts and psychologists, um, and um, fire, fire brigade commanders who were helping us to define how to overcome the situations. And this is actually is captured in this book. <laughs> this is based on official ESA report. Um, but what we did find is that in the long duration mission, we will not be able to follow uh, the existing um, methodology on how we support the crew in space. In currently, on International Space Station, we support astronauts and cosmonauts uh, completely and solely. We don't allow them to uh, resolve problems themselves if the mission control can, uh, control can do that. We monitor them for um, every possible breath they, they may take. Um, we don't trust them to resolve anything 
we do not give them any responsibility or knowledge on how to do things. They follow the specific procedures. However, if there is an incident, they are very capable and they're always consulted because they're trained for it. But in a sense, they totally rely on mission control. In the future, this will not be possible. So in the future, the trust will have to be transferred to, to, the, to people on the mission who are actually departing Earth. They will have to have full knowledge and full responsibility for what they're doing. And as a result, we'll have to have a full trust in them, in what that they're capable to do it. And when people are not trusted with what they would like to do, they give up responsibility and they do not want to even attempt or start, they lose motivation. And in the future, in order for us to understand that anything happens internally with a human being, we will have to trust these people to tell us. I, me, as a psychologist, um, and this is still currently the model on how we uh, will study and research people' e inner experience and any psychological and social um, uh, development that happens, we actually externally observe and interpret. This can no longer happen in exploration missions that go beyond Earth orbit. We have to completely trust um, the crew, we have to develop new tools, we have to develop new ways of teaching the crew and that individual to tell us to share and become, they become an investigator, they become the principal investigator, they become the researcher, they become the scientist on how the human personal inner space changes and tell us. Because no one can tell you what they, ex what you can't tell about somebody else what they're experiencing until they tell you. And similarly, we have to do the same in future Mars missions. So this is a quote. This is actually, uh, I really love this image. It's, um, to me, it looks like an autumn leaf <laughs> on the ground, but it's actually an image from space. And uh, here the Robert Kanker talks about, um, uh, about what it is really like and how the experience changes people. And he says that, his um, wife knows um, by the change in his voice, the children know that he's changed by the way um, he looks at them. And his parents know how he is changed by, because they watched him grow. But really, no one can experience this and understand this unless they've been there. So it's so difficult. They, they have no tools currently, not astronauts, not cosmonauts, on how to really express an understanding on, on what is actually happening. And some are better than others. But that transformational experience is very inner-spaced. <laughs> and I wish we could find the way that uh, the explorers <laughs> can share. So my really open question is that, how can we explore this inner space? Is it at all possible? Are we ready as a... Um, hum hum humanity to let go and let these people tell us what they experience rather than us assuming what it will be like on Mars. Oftentimes on these sorts of panels, there's all this exciting stuff about going to Mars and how we would colonize it and everything, and then I come in with the legal stuff. And like, like, how would you ensure your spacecraft? And I appreciate that that is not the sexiest of topics. Um, but what I'm here to say to you is that I, I think we need to think about the politics and the law behind space exploration and, for example, the potential colonization of, of, of Mars. And um, this is not just out of my own mind. Actually, it's been going on for a long time. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm at the London School of Economics. Um, METI is Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So that's um, an organization that I've been involved in where we're trying to reach out to potential extraterrestrial intelligence um, elsewhere in the world. And I used to be editor-in-chief of, of, of space policy, so that's sort of my background. Um, but the three things that I want to talk to you about, some really tough questions. Um, what are the legalities of potential colonization? That's what I'm going to focus on. 
I know that sounds a little bit dry, but I promise you it's more interesting than it maybe sounds initially. And then I'm going to briefly raise some questions that I don't have any answers to, which is who do we want to represent us when we go out into space? And also, what are the ethics of colonization? So those are the three things that I'm going to talk about. But again, I'm mostly going to be talking about the legalities of it. Um, so one of the things I like to do, it's always interesting to, to get a sense from the audience, it wouldn't be a space event if there wasn't one picture of Neil Armstrong with an American flag on the moon. So I'm going to ask you, the moon, separate, but out of curiosity, show of hands, who thinks that where that, that, that flag was planted meant that the Americans owned that part of the moon? Okay, only a couple of people. It's interesting, over the, I've been asking this question over the years for a long time, and, and I think people are, are increasingly aware. It's, it's confusing, right? Um, I mean, colonization, this is what we've always known. If you plant a flag somewhere, that means you own it, right? And that's what the Americans did. That's what Neil Armstrong did. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, at the time, it, they knew, the Americans knew, that it did not mean that they owned any part of the moon. Um, and this is because celestial bodies and outer space in general is um, not subject to appropriation according to international outer space law. A lot of people don't realize that there's such a thing as outer space law. <laughs> to be honest with you, I didn't before I started researching it um, about 20 years ago. But there is a, a body of law that humans have established through the United Nations to govern outer space. And the most important treaty is the first treaty, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And what it says is outer space um, is the province of all mankind, right? So it kind of belongs to all of us. But also that no nation may lay... Uh, may lay um, ownership to any part of it. It was interesting, I was, I was looking for a picture. I thought I had a picture of the, the front of the treaty. There's, there's only like five copies, and one of them is in Kew Gardens. But if you Google the treaty itself, this is the picture you get. It's a lot of white men. <laughs> um, okay, it was a, it was it was a, it was a, you know subject to the time, but you can kind of get a sense of what happened. So um, so yeah, so as of 1967, we all, as a collective um, through the United Nations, decided that nobody could own outer space, right? So when Neil Armstrong planted that flag on the moon, it was purely symbolic. And in fact, they talked about maybe making it like the United Nations flag or doing all sorts of things, but they decided to go with the American flag, even though it was for all mankind. Um, so, so outer space is the province of all mankind, um, and it cannot be nationally appropriated. These are the two main things that the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 lays out. There are five main treaties that govern outer space, um, but the Outer Space um, treaty is kind of the main one that we all, re some, some people refer to it as, as the constitution for outer space. So it was ratified by almost all countries around the world and it's sort of widely respected. So it sort of forms the basis of outer space law. And yeah, again, it says it's, outer space is the province of all mankind, so it belongs to all of us, um, but at the same time, nobody can own it either. I'm just going to point out, because I'll come back to this, that it says that outer space cannot be nationally appropriated. Um, just a brief bit of history. How did we get here? Um, one of the things that when I started researching in this area is I thought, why, why did we even come up with law for outer space? Um, these discussions started in the 1950s before we had even launched anything to outer space. Why not leave it anarchic? 
But if you put yourself back into the historical context, um, it was the Cold War, and neither the Soviet Union nor the United States wanted to leave outer space as an anarchic realm, right? They wanted to lock each other into some sort of an agreement about how we would govern outer space. And that's how we ended up with the Outer Space Treaty. What's interesting is that there were two sort of obvious legal analogies that we might use. The first was the airspace analogy, right? So in the 1950s as well, commercial air um, space was, uh, air tra uh, travel was increasing. And so there was this idea that maybe, um, well, legally, airspace was, you had your territory above your country, and it went up and up and up and up. So maybe for outer space, once we realized we were probably going to start entering outer space soon, um, we extend that into infinity, right? Um, and that was one of the things that they considered through the United Nations um, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. The other one was a high seas analogy. So as um, many of you will know, you know, you have, you have a country, but then once you get past a certain point, the high seas are what we call neutral territory. And so they are not owned by any particular country. That doesn't mean that they're not subject to regulation, but they're not owned by any particular country. What's interesting is that the United States and the Soviet Union, um, who were the two main players in the international system at this time, had different opinions about which approach we would take. Um, the Soviet Union preferred the airspace analogy, and the United States preferred the high seas analogy. And this was largely down to um, the issue of spying. So because um, if, so if we had an airspace analogy, basically the territory from here up would be completely belonging to the UK and nothing could cross over. Um, the United States had a stronger interest in being able to spy on the Soviet Union by being able to have objects cross around and um, the Soviet Union had um, more of an interest in keeping it closed. It's more complicated than that, and I'm, I, I won't go into a huge amount of history, but in essence, what we ended up with was the Outer Space Treaty, which said it's neutral territory, i.e. the high seas analogy. Outer space does not belong to anyone, and it belongs to everyone um, at the same time. But the key point that I want to make and again, I, I kind of feel bad because I know this isn't as romantic as we all want to always think about space exploration, is that um, you know, the ideas behind space exploration, are, space exploration are really exciting, but politics um, will inevitably in, be involved in, in anything that we do. So that's where we're at sort of with the legal infrastructure. What does this mean for social, uh, celestial bases, so like a, a, a base on the moon, or for colonies. Um, and I'm going to go through four main points here. Firstly, um, um, entities may legally occupy airspace, uh, uh, sorry, um, a, 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 a space in outer space, but not own it. There are also liability issues. I know that sounds really boring. It'll sound more interesting once I get to it, I promise. Um, issues of mining. My, people are talking a lot more about mining these days. And then finally, um, issues about private entities as opposed to countries. So on the first one, um, entities may occupy a space but not claim ownership of it. Um, so this, one of the legal precedents for, that we have for this is Antarctica. Um, you can have a, a science base that's set up on the continent of Antarctica, but you don't own the land that's underneath it. So if we were to have a colony on Mars, one of the possibilities is that you would sort of be squatting there, but not actually um, um, owning it according to the legalities that we have in, in, the, current, in the current setting. Um, I find it kind of ironic because migration is such a big issue here on Earth, and yet, according to this principle, it would mean that anybody could come into the colony that you had. There would be no rights of sort of exclusivity. 
Um, there is a precedent for this um, geostationary or, uh, orbit, orbital slots, satellites uh, sort of occupy a, a place, but they're not allowed to own it. So this, the, legally, this has been going on for a long time, but if it were to extend to the area of colonization, it would probably, well, it would probably, it would inevitably get a lot more legally complicated. Um, but one of the things, I'm gonna go on to ethics briefly at the end, but one of the things I just wanna briefly bring up with you is, you know, is this something that we want, we want to change? So as it stands right now, no country may lay ownership to a celestial body. And I know the idea of Mars colonization and bases on the moon is really exciting, but do we want to open that up to people being able to do? If, if, if Neil Armstrong had planted that American flag, I'm a Yank, you can hear by my accent, but I'm actually quite glad the Americans don't own the moon. If he had planted that flag there and it meant that Americans own the moon, would we be okay with that? So I think we need to think a bit through sort of the ethics that's behind the law. On the second issue, liability, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. This is just that everything that goes up into outer space is, is launched according to, um, it has to be registered with the launching state. So that means that a country has to take responsibility for everything that goes up. Um, I know, it, I, I know it's, it's sort of legal stuff, but at the same time, I think we need to think about the practicalities behind the excitement of potentially colonizing another planet. So let's say something goes really wrong. What happens? As it stands right now, it's the responsibility of the country who has technically launched the object. And I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily right because anymore it's not really one country or um, it might be multiple countries or it's a country you know, um, partnered with, with a, a private entity. But at the same time, if there's one thing we all know, it's that we can be litigious as humans. And so you know, if something horrible goes wrong, who, who's responsible? Who's responsible? So I think that that's something that we need to think about. Um, mining, the other, this is something that keeps coming up m more and more so, I think, because we are technologically closer to being able to potentially mine resources. So according to the Outer Space Treaty, you cannot um, extract resources. Um, no, no, N sorry, I have to be very careful here. According to the Outer Space Treaty, Outer space is for the common heritage of mankind, right? So it doesn't really say what exactly that means in terms of mining. There was another treaty that tried to look into this, but it basically failed. Um, this is a really fast moving area legally right now. And the United Nations um, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, for example, is really talking a lot about this right now. The United States in 2015 passed something they call the Commercial Space Competitive Act, which said that um, um, American corporations could exploit resources in outer space, which kind of goes against everything that has been before. Although it was interesting because they added a caveat that this was so long that it was in line with the international treaties that the United States has signed up to. So it's really not clear. Um, mining, a couple of weird ideas. Some people say if we extract resources and bring them back down to earth, they're no longer celestial resources, so they're subject to appropriation. Other people say, if we exploit resources in situ, which is more likely what we would be doing if we, did a, if we had a colony on, on Mars, for example, um, that it, it doesn't apply to Earth laws because it's, the, you know, it's a different jurisdiction, I guess you could say. So there's a lot of discussion about this. Um, and, you know, also, for example, the Apollo um, missions, they, they brought back 842 pounds worth of space rock. So how do we define, at, at present, it's allowed to bring things back for scientific purposes, um, but how do we sort of define that? So I think that's something that we really need to think about and that I would encourage 
all of you to think about. Um, you know, do we, do we, are we comfortable with the idea of extracting resources from the moon or from Mars for our usage? Um, you know, this is where law crosses over into ethics. Um, I don't know, how do we feel about that? I'm not, honestly, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. Um, I put up this, this Japanese whaling thing. You're also not allowed to, to whale according to international law, but you know the Japanese do it for scientific purposes. I think there could be a chance that people would try to get a, around the legalities of it through these sorts of caveats. But the fact of the matter is that technically you're not supposed to be able to mine um, resources from, from outer space. Um, the last one that I think is really quite important is, are private entities exempt? So the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, again, very well respected, um, written in 1967, and it says that no, um, no country can appropriate space, uh, and that um, it says that no, there, no country can appropriate nation space, uh, 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 and that um, no, uh, nas there's no national um, sovereignty over outer space, right? So this is very much focused on countries. And this is because it was a product of the time, 1967. There were commercial entities dabbling in outer space, but for the most part, as they wrote this up, it was countries that were dealing with outer space. So I don't think that it was them thinking, oh, we're happy for companies to do it, but we don't want countries to do it. It was more the emotional ethos that we want outer space to be neutral. But now that we're in a situation where we have a lot of private entities who are entering into the space industry, there's this question of whether or not this means there's a loophole legally for those types of, of actors, those types of entities. Um, I've put up a picture here. I got asked, they've died down a bit, but for a long time I got asked about these companies that were selling plots of land on the moon um, or plots of land on Mars. And the, the legal reason for that was because they were saying countries can't lay claim to outer space, but companies can. And so I've claimed the moon. Just sorry to anybody who bought one, but th they've actually sold the moon over like 36 times or something, and Mars as well and all that, and I don't think it would hold up legally. But that's where, that, that's where the, the, the legal precedent comes from, because the, 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 the original treaty was so focused on states and countries and nation states. So, you know, what, do we, what does it mean now that we have all of these, all of these, um, um, other entities that are not government-based. Uh, and so, going forward, um, I mean, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. To me, this, that's what I know um, legally. For me, I think it raises a lot of questions ethically. Um, so, um, you know, one question, should Earth law apply to space? We've been operating on this system for sort of 50 years, well, f more than 50 years. Um, there are some people, sorry, actually, that didn't show up very well in my, 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 um, my prezi, I didn't realize that. But what it says is, some people say that we should scrap the pre-existing laws, you know, we're in a different era. I don't like the idea of starting over from scratch, but there are some people who say that. Um, some people will say that technology is going to drive what we're going to do anyway and then law will just have to catch up with it. Again, I don't agree with that. I think we should have conversations about what we want moving forward. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, ultimately, it's really nice talking about exploration, and, but, and I know it seems like kind of a downer, but I don't like the idea of space being completely anarchic. I do think we should have conversations about what we want for it, and what, what, what regulations might be in place for it. Um, the last thing that I'm going to leave you with, just, just ethically. Um, so again, we, we're in a different era. I agree that outer space law, which was developed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, was very much state-focused. And now, 
we have public-private partnerships, we have companies and all this, and technology is moving forward. So I'm not denying any of that, but one of the things that I think we need to ask ourselves is who do we want to represent us in space? Um, I think this is a question that we kind of take for granted. And uh, I'm, I'm often interested, I ask, I ask um, uh, audiences sometimes, you know, oh, are you comfortable if the first colony, colony on Mars is, is by a company? You say SpaceX, people like Elon Musk, and they're like, yeah, great. Um, but then you say, well, what if it's Lockheed Martin or um, a Chinese company? Um, you know, People aren't necessarily comfortable with it being a, a company. Should it be an individual country? Should it be a collective of countries? Um, it does look like these sorts of, uh, that like um, settlement of, not necessarily settlement of Mars, but long-term, uh, long-term engagement with Mars is going to happen. And one of the things that I think that we need to ask ourselves and that I want everybody to think about is who we want to be doing that, who, who pays for it, and who is sort of the vanguard for our civilization as we go to the red planet. Thank you.